this year's lecture series is titled The Good, the Bad and the Ugly, Myths, Images and Imaginings about Jews. And our lectures seek to explore the complex connections and entanglements between visual narratives and ideas of beauty, ugliness and morality that are inherent to representations of Jews and Jewishness in the Western world. The topical range of this year's contributions is very wide. We aim to explore the subject in different historical, social and artistical perspectives, ranging from medieval iconography to Zionism, um, looking at pop culture and at feminism, just to name a few. Our speakers will explore a selection of diverse media, such as painting, photography, literature, film and comics. Superficially, ideas about beauty and ugliness appear to refer to physical markers. The aesthetic categories that a society creates around those are, however, always highly political vehicles that translate ideas about bodies into devices to navigate morality. <clears throat> Ultimately, myths, images and imaginings about Jews have been applied in the negotiation of inclusion and exclusion, or in other words, they have been applied in defining who is part of either the good, the bad, or the ugly. Tonight's lecture will explore a specific canon of art and the ways it uses the, Im the image of the Jew, Christian iconography from the Middle Ages. Okay, hold on. This thing doesn't want to behave the way I want to. There we go. So we are very honored and, of course, extremely happy to welcome one of the most foremost scholars of medieval culture, Professor Sarah Lipton tonight. Let me introduce her briefly. Professor Lipton's academic work in the field of medieval culture is seminal in many respects. It stands out for her unique and nuanced reading of the visual language inherent to medieval art, and her work profoundly reshaped the scholarly understanding of the ways Christians perceived Jews in the Middle Ages. It is indeed very hard to reduce Professor Lipton's academic portfolio into a few short opening words, so please forgive me, Sarah, and please forgive me, everyone, um, that I can only scratch the surface here. Um, Professor Lipton is Professor of History at Stony Brook University in New York, and she is a leading scholar of medieval art and culture, whose work is dedicated to religious identity and experience, Jewish-Christian relations, and art and culture in the High and Later Middle Ages. Professor Lipton is currently a visiting fellow at All Souls College, Oxford, but her path in academia has taken her to many renowned international destinations. She was professor invité at the École des Autitudes et Enseignants Sociales in Paris, a distinguished visiting professor at Queen Mary University of London, and a visiting fellow at Corpus Christ College in Oxford. She has also held fellowships from the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and the Kalman Center for Scholars and Writers. Sarah Lipton is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society in the United Kingdom and the Medieval Academy of America. And in 2024, she has told me she will become the 100th president of the Medieval Academia of America. She has published very widely on medieval culture and Jewish-Christian relations with a particular focus on visual history and culture. Now, let me give you three examples to illustrate Professor Sarah Lipton's seminal and award-winning research that explores visual representations of Jews in the Middle Ages. The first one is images of intolerance, the representation of Jews and Judaism in the Bible Moralisé, published by University of California Press in 1999. This book won the John Nicholas Brown Prize from the Medieval Academy of America. Here, Sarah Lipton explores the complexity of representations of Jews in an illuminated Bible made for the King of France in the 13th century, engaging with both the visual language and the text that surrounds it. The book addresses the nature and development of social intolerance and the role art can play in that context. Sarah Lipton is also author of this title. I hope people online can see it. Just trying to not look too silly now. Um, that's called Dark Mirror, Medieval Origins of Anti-Jewish Iconography that was published in 2014. This work was awarded the Jordan Schnitzer Award by the Association for Jewish Studies. 
as I'm not a medievalist myself, and I'm starting to feel a bit sorry about it after reading Sarah's work, um, I hope you can forgive me for quoting a brief comment by the esteemed medievalist Professor Miri Rubin of Queen Mary University of London to illustrate the impact of this wonderful book. And here I quote, among its many accomplishments, Dark Mirror dispels some widely held ideas about how Christians saw and understood Jews in the Middle Ages. With patience and wisdom, Sarah Lipton unravels an intriguing and fateful history of fascination and disgust. This is a book for anyone interested in the Middle Ages, in the Christian imagination, and in the experience of the Jews." End quote. In addition to its central place in the scholarship dedicated to images and imaginings of Jews in the Middle Ages, Dark Mirror presents a fascinating and gripping account addressing the big and highly relevant issue of how art impacts on the way people see and think about the world. And finally, I would like to mention Professor Lipton's current project that is titled How Pictures Hate origins, mechanisms, and effects of inflammatory imagery. Here, her research ranges from the Middle Ages to today, and I do hope that there will be one day an opportunity here to have a lecture to hear more about it. So you can see I could easily fill the entire evening just talking about Sarah's fascinating research, but I'd rather hand over to her myself, and I'm very happy to open the stage and for those online, the screen, for Professor Sarah Lipton. Sarah, to you. Thank you so much. Yes, um, it's really such a pleasure to be here, I should say, to be back um, working on Jewish history and specifically on the history of anti-Semitism can get a little grim, as you might imagine, but there's a real upside. You make wonderful friends. <laughs> I'm happy to see Kinga again um, and to really um, re-engage with my colleagues in the UK who work on similar topics after having been, you know, kept away from each other for three and a half years or something like that. Uh, so today I'm going to both do a bit of an overview of my most recent book and a little a bit of an introduction to the book that I am starting to work on now. So you will see some relatively contemporary imagery. Seven years ago, I published an op-ed article in the New York Times entitled, and they gave it this title, not me, um, The Words That Killed Medieval Jews. I opened the article by asking, do harsh words lead to violent acts? And I proceeded to discuss several episodes in medieval history in which anti-Jewish rhetoric in did inspire anti-Jewish violence. The piece was prompted by several remarks made during, during the 2016 US Republican presidential primaries. Donald Trump referring to Mexican immigrants as rapists, uh, Carly Fiorina, she was also a Republican candidate briefly, insisting that a woman's health care provider harvested baby parts. But throughout that presidential campaign, and also during the debate surrounding Britain's exit from the European Union, and I was living here in the UK at the time, for part of the time, I, as well as several other commentators, have been equally concerned about the effects of pictures, specifically political imagery published in tabloid newspapers or circulated on visually oriented social media, uh, such as Instagram, Reddit, and Twitter. And here's just a small selection of a large and ugly corpus. And in the realm of pictures too, medieval anti-Judaism offers some instructive and very sobering precedent. It demonstrates that visual propaganda, to an even greater degree, I think, than strong words, can arouse and redirect emotions and biases in often unintended ways, sometimes to calamitous effect. This is especially true of images that stereotype, that mark off Jews, and as we shall see, other marginalized or targeted peoples in the eyes of the public, so as to imply that they are physically different, and by extension, an extension that seems logical to people, that, but when you think about it is simply ridiculous, um, morally deficient. The history of Jews in medieval art is, of course, a very large and very complicated topic. So today I'm just going to focus on three moments in the evolution of Jewish iconography, visual developments, which in their aggregate, though only in certain contexts and circumstances, significantly and very negatively affected how Jews were seen and consequently how they were treated. 
These same techniques also figure prominently in current political and social media imagery, threatening the security and the rights of Jews and also a range of other groups and populations. The first development, um, development I'm going to discuss was really very basic, the creation of an iconographical device, a visual language to render Jews visible, that is visually identifiable in artworks. This practice is now so taken for granted that it's often assumed to be eternal and natural. However, the fact is that for many hundreds of years, Jews could not be visually distinguished in Western imagery. This is a slide from the later 900s, and it shows Pilate um, showing Jesus to the high priests of the Jewish people, as well as some, some knights about to execute him. And you can see that the high priests, presumably Jewish figures, and the knights, presumably, or soldiers, presumably Roman figures, have absolutely no difference in terms of their features, their coloring, their faces. They don't wear any headgear. They are not bearded, etc. When Jews did finally begin to be identified in Christian art around the year 1000, so shortly after this image was made, it was somewhat anticlimactically by means of a hat. As any handbook of medieval iconography will attest, and as any glance at any illuminated manuscript or stained glass window from the later 12th or the 13th century makes it very clear, um, Jews can be recognized in medieval art by various versions of the point or peaked headgear known as the Peleum Cornutum, the horned cap, or simply as the Judenhut, the Jewish hat. The Judenhut is so familiar to medievalists that for many decades, no one had thought to ask when or why it first became a Jewish sign. In my most recent book, Dark Mirror, which Kinga showed you, I did just that. I determined that the hat first appeared on the heads of Jewish figures, or rather Judean figures, specifically Judean priests and elders, in an illustrated manuscript known as the Second Gospel Book of Bishop Bernhard von Hildesheim, which dates to about the year 1015. They didn't show Jews wearing these hats because such headgear was actually seen on contemporary Jews. There is zero evidence that Jewish men regularly wore such hats in 11th century Europe. Indeed, Jewish men probably did not regularly wear hats at all. Covering the head was not considered a rel religious obligation in the period, and no Jewish texts refer to typical, much less to required, headgear. The yarmulke didn't become widely common until the 16th century, so 600 years after this. Nor do the hats serve here yet to mark Jews as evil or even as different. Rather, these hats are modeled on the headgear of ancient Near Eastern royal crowns or priestly mitres, and they had previously served in early medieval art to convey high status and antique wisdom. So this is just an image of the Persian king, Cephas, and you can see he's wearing a very similar kind of pointed red hat. These hats appear in Bernouard's manuscript for a somewhat different reason, however. They're not calling these people ancient Persians. They're here because Bernouard himself belonged to the first generation of Catholic bishops to adopt the tall pointed hat, now known as the mitre, as a badge of office. Before that, um, bishops did not seem to wear any particular kind of hat either. My argument is that Bishop Bernward used this sign in his own manuscript to spur a kind of process of self-reflection in portraying Judean priests and elders as these are, but also the three magi as well. They are looking up at Christ and about to give him their gifts. Um, in his own headgear, the manuscript visually linked, let's see, okay, visually linked him, Bishop Bernward himself, with his various spiritual forebears, both good and bad. Obviously, the Judean priests being bad, um, the three magi being good. So looking at and comparing all the pointy-hatted men in his book prompted Bishop Bernouard to contemplate the disparate choices made by religious leaders when faced with divine truth. And in fact, he had on his own tombstone a line from Job engraved in which he said, I hope that in the next life I will see Christ and I will see him properly. Now, Bishop Bernard's self-reflected use of the pointed hat was not widely imitated. In subsequent decades, I've found only one or two manuscripts that adopted his practice 
of depicting New Testament priests and elders and pointed hats. But then in the year 1084, in a giant Romanesque Bible, um, Romanesque is the style and a giant bi Bible is actually the genre. They're about this big and they suddenly became popular in the 1070s and 1080s. Um, made for a reformist monastery in modern day Belgium, an artist assigned the same Pileum Cornutum pointed hat to Old Testament prophets as well. This is the prophet Sophonius. In this new location, the hat connoted not status and power so much as antiquity, just ancientness. The prophets who are dressed in more modest attire than the Magi or the New, Pre or the new Testament priests had been in Baron Ward's man manuscript are also here depicted with beards, which are signs of age and maturity. And they hold scrolls as he does right here, which was the ancient form of a book. So all three symbols now indicate that the prophets lived long, long, long ago. This particular application of the hat iconography, as well as the beard and the scroll, um, spread very rapidly. A new kind of reform movement called for the filling of churches with um, more kinds of art, and this art spread across Europe, and with it, images of Hebrew prophets wearing pointed hats, which became nearly ubiquitous. Uh, this is a particular striking example from Augsburg. This kind of um, prophet wearing bearded hat carrying a scroll served almost as a sort of author portrait, suggesting that the Hebrew prophets wrote the new kinds of imagery, and therefore they're lending the prestige of the Old Testament, which of course Christians revere as the word of God, to the innovative new manuscripts and monuments in which they appeared. And this was necessary because medieval people by and large did not like new things. Um, they valued tradition and they feared innovation and even the most innovative people in the reform movement consistently denied they were doing anything new. No, 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 we're just going back to the good old days. So that's not why I'm arguing that the prophets kind of embody the good old days in a way. Um, but if the prophets hats and scrolls and beards proclaim their antique wisdom, their traditionalism, they also confirm the passing of their age and the advent of a new, more perfect Christian era. So that the ultimate effect of presenting the Hebrew prophets as antique, aged, and old-fashioned was to underscore the outdated nature of Judaism. It was a long time ago. Now, this, of course, was a long-standing tenet of Christian doctrine, but it's now given visual expression for the first time, and I'm going to argue that that matters. Now, as images from the Bible and images from saints' lives expanded in scope, hat-wearing Jewish prophets were joined by a broader range of previously undepicted Jewish characters. New characters who had not appeared in art before the about 1100 now began to be shown. People like ancient Judeans who were not prophets, um, for example. When placed on the heads of these non-prophetic ancient Judeans, the hat now signified neither high office, they're not priests or kings, nor antique wisdom, they're not prophets, but it came to signify blindness or backwardness or stasis, resistance to new knowledge. So here on the left, we have Israelites from the scene in the book of Numbers when they were crossing through the desert and a bunch of, of serpents bit the Israelites and they died. And Moses prayed to God, how come you rescued us from Egypt just to kill us? And God said, raise up a brazen serpent on a pole. And when the Israelites look at it, somehow you can do that when you're dead, um, they will come back to life. So this is a scene of the Israelites looking up at the brazen serpent being raised from the dead. On the right, this is a scene of Jesus after he has been resurrected, but before he ascends to heaven, um, he's, he's, he's on the road on the way to a town called Emmaus. He stops and he has dinner, and two people who had known him in his life have dinner with him, but they don't recognize him. And my argument is that the hats on the heads of these figures identify them, first of all, as Judeans or, Jew or Juda Jews or Judeans, but they also show people who do not recognize the truth. These disciples don't recognize Jesus. These um, Israelites brought back to life see the brazen serpent, but right above the brazen serpent in the image is um, a picture of Christ, which they cannot see. So 
when they are shown in scenes like this, it shows blindness and a kind of resistance to new knowledge, a kind of being frozen in time. Within a few decades, the number and the range of such Jewish hat wearing figures all displaying a kind of spiritual blindness worked to change the meaning of the sign of the hat. By the middle of the 12th century, the pointed hat simply came to be an identifying mark of Jewishness. You could tell someone's a Jew if they wear that hat, and that is about it. Now, the Jewishness that was indicated by the Judenhut did not necessarily bear any one fixed value. Both good Jewish characters and bad Jewish characters were endowed with the hat which also occasionally was still used to signify a kind of authority rather than just Jewish identity. However, starting around the year 1165, a second and distinctly more hostile visual device was added to the repertoire of Jewish symbols, the caricatured Jewish face. It first appeared in a very specific kind of image, artworks influenced by a new devotional trend, which promoted con compassionate contemplation of a mortal suffering Christ. Before these decades, Christ had been shown alive on the cross, eyes open, perfectly healthy, wearing a crown. It's just around the middle of the 1100s, they start showing him dead or dying, slumped over like this, very pale, um, being pierced in his side with a spear, obviously in a way that suggests pain or torture of some kind. So Christians were supposed to look at this image and feel compassion. But we have a series of texts that, that testify to the fact that compassion did not come automatically to Christian viewers. Um, this looked to many new Christian viewers undignified, and it upset some Christians. Apparently, it even repelled some Christians. So what to do? Artists created figures to serve as counter models for the Christian viewer. In a range of images, Christ is glared at by visibly villainous enemies who are easily recognizable as Jews via their pointed hats, but who now have new characteristics. They have angry and distorted expressions. And this, by the way, is the female personification of Judaism known as synagogue, wearing a Jewish hat and kind of frowning and glaring and pointing. And this banner here says, cursed is he who hangs on the tree. Uh, so she's pointing at Christ. She's right here in the image. She's pointing at Christ and cursing him. So Christ is glared at visibly by villainous enemies with angry and distorted expressions, grotesque and exaggerated noses, and arrogant or blasphemous gestures which display their lack of humanity, their lack of compassion, their indifference to Christ's suffering, and their blindness to his divinity, with the goal of pushing Christians looking at this art toward opposite emotions and reactions. So here, of course, these are the tormentors of Christ. You might assume the Jews who killed Christ were always shown as ugly in art, but they were not, not until in fact, I think this might be the very earliest image showing Jews looking ugly in art. And you can see they've got the hats. They're shown in profile. They have long um, beards. They have very dark eyes. This is um, a small little object in the v &A Museum if you want to go look at it. So it doesn't blow up incredibly well. But this Jew is turning around and slapping Jesus as he's carrying the cross to the site of the crucifixion. And he's got this distorted um, almost bestial looking profile. And he also is pointing in a mocking or accusatory way. Now for the rest of the 12th century and for several decades beyond the turn of the 13th, the features of Jews like this remained a little too varied to constantate constitute markers of identity on their own. Jews had kind of ugly looking noses, but there were many different kinds of ugly looking noses. Some were long and tapering, some were snout like, and moreover, the same noses sometimes appeared on non-Jewish figures as well. I'm thinking of this profile who looks so much like the one in the small object slapping Jesus, but this in fact is a Syrian fighting the Maccabees. These are the Jewish Maccabees here. Um, so that there was no one single identifiable Jewish nose or Jewish face. However, by the later 13th century, 
as artists began to display in general, and not just regarding Jews, increased interest in realism, in human physiognomy and anatomy, the range of features assigned to Jews consolidated into one fairly narrowly construed, simultaneously grotesque and somewhat naturalistic face, and the hook-nosed, pointy-bearded Jewish caricature was born. This is an illustrative Psalm 52 from the Vulgate. It's a different number in um, Hebrew and Protestant Psalms 51, and it opens, the fool saith in his heart there is no God. The fool was regularly interpreted to be a Jew, and he used to be shown as Jewish by the pointed hat, but here all you need to do is see this face, and that you know by the year 1340 when this was painted, you know that this is a foolish Jew, sorry. Now, these various iconographical developments altogether reveal a growing desire to make Jews visible, to mark them off in the eyes of the viewing public. Some images help explain why this is so important. Images alleging Jewish, Jewish duplicity act themselves to uncloak the moral turpitude that Jews were said to hide under a more innocent exterior. So that this is an image from the set of manuscripts made for the King of France about which, um, which I studied in my first book. Um, it's commenting on a text from the book of Joshua and it said the Gibeonite people who deceived Joshua signify, symbolize, lying Jewish usurers who tell princes and prelates that they are better than they are. The adjoining illustration to that commentary text shows Jews bowing before a king, but they're only pretending to submit to him. Their deceptiveness is indicated by their torn clothing, that's a rip and this guy's barefoot, suggesting a poverty, which is belied by the fact that he carries a big bulging money bag, and of course that he was called a lying Jewish usurer. And this stance, which closest to the king looks subservient, is also shown to be fake as the Jews behind him are standing up straight and not bowing to the king in the same way. Rather, they are happily proclaiming the fact that they are manipulating and deceiving the monarch. So now we have two iconographical innovations, the introduction of the Jewish hat and the endowing of Jews with hostile and distorted expressions and stereotypical features, um, ultimate, ultimately leading to the creation of a really recognizable Jewish face, these innovations had real world effects. Art influenced the way Christians imagined and thought about Jews and Christian attitudes and policies toward Jews consequently transformed as well. Although the use of the pointed hat to identify Jews might seem an undramatic, even anticlimactic development, it had significant implications. It singled out Jews as different in art. And after decades of seeing Jews marked off as different and dangerous in artworks, medieval Christians couldn't help but notice that Jews did not look different in reality. In 1215, an ecumenical, that means continent-wide gathering of clerics known as the Fourth Lateran Council, ordered that Jews be forced to wear certain identifying garments so that they could not deceive unsuspecting Christians. And the decree specifically says, because there are many parts of Europe where you cannot tell a Jew by looking at one. Although this decree did not specify the form that such garments should take, the decrees of two church councils that followed up on that in 1267, I think totally concern the centrality of the artworks I've been showing you to such legislation, because those decrees ordered Jews to wear the so-called Pileum Cornutum, as their ancestors used to do. Now, in the absence of century-old photo albums, I think we have to assume that the primary evidence for how previous generations of Jews used to dress was Christian imagery. Now, these church degrees express no desire to harm Jews. The stated reason for the Fourth Lateran Council rule was to prevent unlawful sexual intercourse between Jews and also Muslims and Christians. The quote fully says, it happens at times that through ever Christians have relations with the women of Jews and Saracens and Christians and Saracens with 
and Jews and Saracens with Christian women. Therefore, that they may not, under pretext of error of this sort, excuse themselves in the future for the excesses of such prohibited intercourse, we decree that such Jews and Saracens of both sexes in every Christian province and all times shall be marked off in the eyes of the public from other peoples through the character of their dress. I think we can all question whether this is the real motivation underlying the badge decree, since in fact, sexual encounters are the only place where Jews are physically marked as different, at least Jewish men. Um, so it's not all that convincing. No circumcision was practiced among Christians in medieval Europe. Indeed, in going on to note that this very law has been adjoined on them in the writings of Moses, Numbers 1537, the Fourth Lateran Decree implies respect for Jewish practice. But Jews immediately saw danger in thus being singled out. They petitioned secular rulers not to enforce such rules. They paid fines and fees in order to obtain exemptions from batch laws, and that, in fact, might have been the real motivation for the whole thing. Um, and sought permission from rabbinical authorities to disguise themselves as Christians when traveling in order to avoid being tacked on the road, attacked on the road. It is clear that for a minority population, visibility was equated with vulnerability. Those of us who know the sequel to the Nazi Jewish badge law should hardly be surprised at the effects of its medieval precursor. Discriminatory laws limiting Jews' residence, social interactions, and economic activities followed, as did eventually violent attacks and mass expulsions. The depiction of Jews with hostile and angry expressions and making insulting gestures toward the crucifix aggravated the effect of the pointed hat. Although the aim of such images was, I do argue and I believe, to arouse love and compassion for Christ, an unintended, although I think we might posit foreseeable, side effect was to arouse fear of and anger toward his enemies. It is surely no coincidence that the invention of such images exactly coincide with the writing of the very first text in which Jews were accused of ritually murdering a Jewish child. The text is known as the Life and Miracles of St. William of Norwich. It was written around 1160 or 1170 by an English monk named Thomas of Monmouth. The description of the Jews who allegedly murdered little William is eerily reminiscent of the depictions of Christ's mockers. They are said to have tortured William with knotted ropes and then tied him to a cross formed by a post and beam in their house pierced his hand and foot with nails, wounded his side, and stabbed him in the head with thorns, all in imitation and mockery of the crucifixion. They are called cruel, eager to inflict pain, driven by mad cruelty and motivated by malice. When a group is labeled and depicted as cruel, brutal, and dangerous, its members are more likely to be treated in turn with cruelty and brutality and their danger cited to justify repression or violence against them. And sure enough, in the French city of Blois in 1171, 31 Jews accused of ritually murdering, murdering a child were burned at the stake by Count Thibault V, even though no child was missing and no body was ever found. In 1182, when King Philip II of France expelled more than a thousand Jews from the Ile de France, he cited their alleged ritual murder of a boy named Richard. Both Count Thibault and King Philip were probably motivated by a combination of political and economic considerations, but the fact remains that they felt the need to and were able to justify their actions by pointing to the Jews' villainy and danger. The ascription to Jews of stereotypical features further undermined their status and position in Christendom. It suggested that the iniquity of the Jews was inherent in their nature, in their very bodies, and so it paved the way for the transformation of religious anti-Judaism into racialized anti-Semitism. Perhaps paradoxically, though, negative feelings were not directed only against those Jews who looked like their stereotypes. Instead, in a tortured kind of logic, Christians concluded that if many Jews did not look like their caricature, it was because they were adept at deceit and disguise. Indeed, the earliest existing anti-Jewish caricature, a doodle that's at the top of a tax receipt roll from 1233 in the National Archives, often Kew Gardens, 
presents a well-known Jewish scholar and financier as the Antichrist. He's the guy at the top with three faces. That is how they showed the Antichrist in medieval art. And the Antichrist was the ultimate embodiment of deceit, duplicity, and disguise. And this cartoon also enlists a host of symbols associated with masking and imposture. I've written an entire article about this, which was turned into a blog, um, so you can look further. So I'll just point out that the blowing of a trumpet is from the French word trompé, which is a play on words. It's both trumpet and to fool, to deceive in some way. This theme persisted well into the 20th century, I would add. The Nazis, the historical group most convinced of Jews' racial distance, difference, and I should say the ones most dedicated to studying medieval anti-Jewish art, um, frequently warned against Jews' ability to hide their true looks and natures. The children's story called The Poisonous Serpent warns its young readers that Jews were adept at disguise, quote, but one day, the Jew lets the mask fall and shows what he really is, a poisonous snake among people. Uh, can you click out of the, the chat box, please? Um, there are various kinds of poisonous snakes. There are poisonous snakes in the most varied countries in the world. The same is true of Jews, but even there are big ones and little ones, fat ones and thin ones. Remember, this is a children's book. Black-haired and even blonde ones. But even if they look much different, if they hide in various occupations and speak the various languages of the world, they are and they remain Jews. And Goebbels wrote, today the Jews are simply practicing mimicry, the art of appearance and disguise, an art at which the Jews are extraordinarily good since they have always had to use it to maintain their precarious existence. Toward the end of the Middle Ages, the iconography devised for Jews took one more turn. It was extended to apply to other suspected groups, including heretics. These are heretics being burned at the stake in a so-called auto da fe, wearing a pointed hat right here, carrying pseudo-Hebraic symbols on it, and sorcerers and witches. Again, we have here the pointed hat looks like a mitre, but of course the mitre is based on the same hat that Jews were based on. And Muslims, this is an image of St. Thomas de Quine, Aquinas defeating the Muslim philosopher Averroes, who looks more like a Jewish rabbi than like a Muslim philosopher, really. One might assume that such a diffusion of negative signs would at least lessen the pressure on Jews or distract from anti-Judaism, but in fact, it had the opposite effect. Charges of contamination and collusion were now hurled against the Jews, who were believed, believed to conspire with the enemies of Christendom or to infect the body Christian. These would pro prove to be the most harmful accusations of all. It was allegations of contagion, in this case of infecting converts with Judaism and thus turning them into heretics, that led to the Jews' expulsion from Spain in 1492. I don't know if you know the story of the Spanish Inquisition. They were not allowed to target Jews. They had no authority over Jews. They were allowed to target Jews who had been forcibly converted to Christian Christianity. And they were afraid that those forcibly converted Christians might not have a fully sincere faith. Go figure, they didn't question their own actions. They blamed Jews of infecting them with the disease of Judaism. And that's why Jews were expelled from Spain to protect the converts from their contagion. Jews in 16th century Hungary and Bohemia lived in the words of the great historian Salo Baron, under a cloud of suspicion of being supporters of, even spies for the Turks. And when Martin Luther eventually gave up of hope of converting the Jews, he turned against them very viciously and accused them of allying with the Turks in an attempt to overrun Christendom. How much agency do pictures have in all of these developments? Now, I'm obviously not arguing that art was solely responsible for all the woes encountered by medieval Jews. It is obviously possible to look at a picture of a Jew wearing a pointed hat, turning his back on Christ, even hammering a nail into Christ's feet, and yet not take any action against a living Jew. Without strong additional anti-Jewish fanning, images alone are highly unlikely to ignite an anti-Jewish fire. But in later medieval Europe, and I'm afraid in our own day, and I'll get to that, um, such fanning was all too frequent. 
a Christian viewer of anti-Jewish images who had just returned from a long and difficult crusade, listened to a Good Friday sermon imprecating the Jews for crucifying Christ, heard rumors or read reports of a ritual murder, lost a child and didn't know where she went, um, lost a beloved child to accident or disease, quarreled with a Jewish neighbor, or failed to balance the family books, may well have gazed at images of grimacing mockers or hook-nosed rabbis and felt his rage and frustration rise until he sought an outlet in anti-Jewish action. Now, none of the visual developments I've surveyed too rapidly today are limited to the Middle Ages, unfortunately. In fact, both the deployment of anti-Jewish themes and symbols and their redeployment to stigmatize non-Jewish individuals and their ideas and actions have seen a striking and distressing resurgence in recent years. Perhaps most notably here in the UK in the debate surrounding Britain's uh, exit from the European Union and in US electoral politics. These two realms have each been characterized by pretty virulent anti-immigrant rhetoric against Eastern Europeans, especially Polish and Romanian immigrants and Muslim immigrants and refugees from Syria in the UK, and against Muslim and Latin American immigrants in the US. In both cases, anti-Jewish imagery and discourse, both overt and subtle, have played prominent roles, even though in neither case are Jews direct or explicit objects of partisan ire, much less central to the issues under discussion. I'm only going to very briefly discuss two examples, but I'm writing a whole book on many more. On November 16th, 2015, the British tabloid, the Daily Mail, published a cartoon entitled Mac on Europe's Open Borders. It depicts a crowd of people carrying suitcases, one a bedroll, in one case a gun, accompanied by scurrying rats as they walk past a sign inscribed, Welcome to Europe. A column in the Guardian newspaper called this a deeply incendiary image, pointing out that Nazi propaganda regularly portrayed Jews as rats. But the article stopped short of labeling, labeling the cartoon overtly anti-Semitic and racist and quoted two experts who read the image differently. They noted that the rats were probably meant to represent terrorists hiding among refugees and concluded that the vilification of terrorists was fair enough though one of the experts hastened to add that she did not endorse the anti-Brexit message of the cartoon. However, the newspaper editors weren't completely satisfied with that analysis, and though they came to me and asked, to look at, asked me to look at the cartoon in some detail. I told them that, yes, it's certainly true that rats can symbolize a range of concepts, some having nothing to do with Jews. But other aspects of the cartoon were a little more concerning. Two of the men are depicted with large, bulbous, net downward curving noses. To anyone with even a passing knowledge of graphic history, these profiles cannot fail to recall anti-Semitic caricature. The men's headgear reinforces the association. One of the men, right, can I get it on the screen? No, I can't, but um, one of the men just to the right of the center of the image wears a turban, presumably to mark him as a Muslim. However, as part of the trend of asserting collusions between Jews and Turks that I mentioned earlier, Jews were frequently shown in Western art wearing turbans as well. I would also add that the Mideasterners who most concerned immigration opponents in 2015 were Syrian, Syrian refugees and Syrians do not wear turbans. Now, this man's Jewishness is Jewishness in quotes, is further suggested by the glasses perched on his nose. Spectacles have been used since the 15th century to symbolize Jews' spiritual blindness and physical degeneracy. Here is a rabbi supervising the crucifixion, sorry, the circumcision of Jesus, wearing spectacles and reading his book, and the spectacles show that he is so nearsighted he cannot understand the true meaning of the word of God that the Jews were granted. Um, they are not, however, spectacles are not traditional elements of anti-Muslim imagery. The second big-nosed man, a uh, little to the left of center, wears a military-looking cap and carries a gun. This, too, might be seen as referring to current conditions and actors in the Mideast, but it, again, also echoes anti-Jewish caricature, this time of Jews as Soviets or communists. This is a cartoon that appeared... Um, 
in German propaganda de uh, directed towards Russians saying that the Jew was the, the ruler of the Bolsheviks. And I think his hat looks strikingly like the hat of the figure in the cartoon. It's certainly an old fashioned looking kind of army cap, not something anybody would be wearing in 2015. Most troubling to me, however, is the man on the far right of the cartoon. He also looks very old fashioned. He's wearing an old fashioned checkered coat and matching breeches. When is the last time you saw breeches on this, the roads of Europe exactly? Um, and he has a large protruding belly. These are not the clothing and physique typically assigned by, by cartoonists to Syrian refugees or to Polish and Romanian immigrant workers. They are, however, the attributes par excellence of the capitalist Jew in Nazi imagery. So I would say that the cartoon undoubtedly echoes anti-Jewish iconography, but I'm not saying that it does so in order to accuse Jews of overrunning the borders of Europe. Rather, Jews appear here, Jewish signs appear here for the same reason that they became so prominent in Christian art. First, for the qualities they are alleged to embody. The anti-immigrant movement criticized proponents of Europe and open borders as elitist, capitalist, urban, cosmopolitan, and globalist, all labels frequently assigned to Jews in the Middle Ages, not globalist, everything else they were called, as well as in the 20th and the 21st centuries as updated versions of the allegations of avarice and irreligiousness. Did I skip something? No, as updated allegations of the avarice and the secularism and irreligiousness hurled at them in the Middle Ages. Second, Jewish signs and Jews appear in art for the gaps they help paper over and the connections they help forge. Opponents of immigration target two very disparate groups, global capital, which is held to exercise undue control over the national economy and to ignore or exploit native meaning indigenous British born workers and Eastern foreign parasitic newcomers, newcomers who are said to displace or harm native workers. These two groups, global capitalist rich and foreign parasitic uh, manual laborers might seem to have little in common, but since Jews have been cast in both roles at various points in history, they provide a kind of conceptual link. Third, Jewish signs appear for the emotions they arouse. In the absence of any readily familiar verbal or visual rhetoric of Polish or Romanian or Syrian perfidy or danger, anti-Jewish imagery furnishes a viscerally powerful arsenal from which anti-immigration activists can draw. Similar processes are apparent in imagery accompanying the 2016 US election and again many since. This is a picture retweeted by Donald Trump on July 2nd, 2016, which originally appeared on an alt-right website. It superimposes Hillary Clinton's face against a backdrop of $100 bills. Directly next to, and in fact slightly intruding upon Clinton's face, is a red six-pointed star inscribed with the words, most corrupt candidate ever. Trump tweet, Trump's tweeted commentary on the image declared, crooked Hillary makes history. As with the Daily Mail Brexit cartoon, the anti-Semitism of this image has been a matter of debate. Trump himself vigorously denied any anti-Semitic connotation, tweeting two days later after the criticism had grown, dishonest media is trying their best to depict a star in a tweet as the star of David, rather than a sheriff's star or a plain star. Some neutral observers, too, have questioned the anti-Semitism of the tweet, noting that Trump's daughter is married to an observant Jew, and that as candidate Trump did not explicitly embrace anti-Semitism or promote any anti-Jewish policies. This image, however, follows the same pattern and employs the same logic of so much medieval anti-Jewish imagery and of the Brexit cartoon. Six-pointed stars, like rats, may indeed have various meanings. But the iconography of this image points to one particular meaning, to situate a six-pointed star against the background of money, along with allegations of corruption and crookedness, is to echo many centuries worth of imagery painting Jews as corrupt, greedy, deceitful, and crooked, exactly the qualities being imputed to Clinton. This image then, um, in this image, the star hints at both a likeness and a collusion 
even conspiracy between Clinton and Jews. The hint, only implicit in the tweeted image and probably only audible to those listening for it, it's what we call a visual wolf whistle, dog whistle, sorry, um, has since been articulated more explicitly. As many commentators have pointed out, the last Republican campaign ad of the 2016 election claimed that Hillary Clinton meets, meets in secret with international bankers to plan the destruction of global sovereignty in order to enrich these global interest powers. This almost exactly replicates the words of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Both the Daily Mail cartoon then and the retweeted image use anti-Jewish iconography to indict non-Jewish targets by means of guilt through similarity and guilt by association. Now in highlighting these visual and conceptual parallels, I do not mean to accuse the English cartoonist or the former president of intentional anti-Semitism. I'm not absolving them either. I just don't claim to have any insight into the secret hearts of individual human beings. I'm a historian. I study patterns and effects. And the example of the medieval anti-Jewish iconography is sobering in that regard. Just as the impact of medieval images was not limited to the painted page, there is ample evidence that violence follows in the wake of contemporary cartoons and tweets. In the UK, reports of assaults on and harassment of Polish immigrants, Russian, uh, sorry, Romanian immigrants, and Muslim citizens proliferated during the Brexit debate. In Leeds, a bunch of Sikhs were attacked simply because they wore turbans. In 2016, in my own hometown, hometown of New York City, a community that likes to pride itself on tolerance and multiculturalism, two Muslim wear women wearing hijabs were attacked. The attackers were claimed they were provoked by a sense of Muslim danger. Two different men yelled out terrorist as they assaulted their victim. But surely these women were not chosen because they themselves actually inspired fear. The women are far less likely to conduct terror attacks than men. And both the women were young and rather small. One was with her child. It was clearly their visible difference that led them to be targeted. The representation of Muslims in US popular culture has constructed an association between headscarves and anti-Americanism, just as medieval art created an association between pointed hats and hostility to Christ and Christians. But the transference to other groups of anti-Jewish signs hardly exempts Jews from hatred. To the contrary, anti-Semitic hate crimes also have spiked dramatically in the years since the election of Donald Trump. In the fall after the election, neo-Nazis who accessorized themselves like medieval crusaders marched through Charlotte, Charlottesville, Virginia, yelling, Jews will not replace us. That refers to uh, an immigration conspiracy theory that tells that Jews are, are orchestrating the importation of brown people to the United States of America in order to re replace Christians and take over everything. A year after the Charlottesville march, 11 Jews were murdered at a Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania synagogue by a man who hours before had posted, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society likes to bring invaders in that kill our people. I can't sit by and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw your optics, I'm going in. The building into which he went was decorated by a very self-evident Star of David. My argument then is that marking off a people in the eyes of the public has damaging real world effects. Images shape what we see and how we see it. Propagandists and advertisers alike have long recognized and exploited the emotional and imaginative impact of art. We have all been taught to desire whiter teeth, to fear treacherous enemies, or alternatively to pity suffering orphans by the images projected all around us. Pictures that purport to convey the essence of an entire group pose a particular danger to democracy. The point of an ethnic, racial, or religious stereotype is to turn correlation into causation. A candidate who espouses a criticized policy, an immigrant who seeks entry into a safer or more prosperous nation, a philanthropist who supports a contested cause, doesn't just happen to be Jewish or Polish or Muslim, stereotyping imagery alleges. He or she does so because he or she is Jewish or Polish or Muslim, and so by definition has an ulterior and probably sinister intent. 
This renders the content of the criticism or the reasons for the migration or the political opposition or the benefits or detriments of the policy immaterial. It shifts attention from the actions or policies under examination or the circumstances being fled to the identity of the examiner or the migrant. For viewers who are not intensely anti-Semitic, xenophobic, or Islamophobic already, it may raise doubts about the purity of the politicians or the migrants' motives. For confirmed anti-Semites, xenophobes, and Islamophobes, it focuses and channels already existing anger and hatred. The effect of this process can be lethal, metaphorically for democracy, because it shields a politician from, necess from necessary scrutiny and a policy from unbiased consideration. And literally, for Jews, or immigrants, or Muslims, or any group repeatedly subject to hateful imagery, because history, I hope I have convinced you, has shown many times over the power of the image to provoke actual violence. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Sarah, for this wonderful and and exciting talk. I think there's there's a lot to discuss. How this is working, I never know. So, um, what we are going to do now is we open the floor for questions um, to Sarah and those attending online. I would kindly ask you to post your questions into the chat with your name, and we will also um, raise those here in the room by reading them out. So, any questions in the room to begin with? Any questions online? Just I didn't realize that I'm going to talk. I just to... thank you very much. You covered so much. Gosh, to be a bit spontaneous, um, uh, you covered so much. But then the early Christians uh, didn't know how they, they were illiterate and they didn't know how to read that. So they had to look at pictures to and then. Uh, and uh, to, to get some information. But before that, the first early, early first century, it started with maybe Tacitus, the historian, that said that the Jews brought, uh, the Hebrews brought the plagues on Egypt. And then, of course, the Visigoths and their uh, decrease influenced very much the. Um, the um, the Nazi, they gave so much information to the Nazis, really. They created the labels for the Jews when they joined the Catholic Church. And But what really baffles me is the German idealis uh, idealism of, uh, of uh, Kant. So he called, he called uh, they, they accused him of being preaching like a Jew. And he thought that the Jews were submissive, and Fichte it created the, this uh, the the science of hate. And then Hegel uh, said that the I, I finish in a minute. I just want to say that that uh, the Jews' fate is going to be the fate of Macbeth, and Schopenhauer called them the stinking Jews. And Nietzsche said, oh, they knew how to write stories. And uh, I'm thankful that Heine came and he gave the Jews of Germany um, a, bit, a bit more dignity. And I'm disappointed that Freud said, oh, I'm a godless Jew. Um, and now, and now uh, they, they, uh, I think anti-Semitism would have vanished, but now we have Muslim political anti-Semitism, and they rely a lot on displaying pictures. There's an awful lot to respond to there, and I don't think I can cover everything because, unfortunately, the history of anti-Semitism in text as well as image is very long. Yeah. Um, I am making a specific argument, I mean, in the book that was mentioned here and in this talk, uh, not that there was never any anti-Semitism in the early Middle Ages or that there was not anti-Semitism based on things other than images. I'm talking about 
the role that visually identifying Jews plays in taking textual allegations against the Jews, which we can trace right back to the Gospels, if we want to read them that way, and we might not want to read them way as scholars of the Gospels, but that's certainly how most Christian scholars up until very recent periods did read them. But um, so there has always been, you can go back and read the letters of Paul as anti-Jewish if you want, although Paul himself was Jewish and thought that he was realizing the truth of Judaism rather than eradicating Judaism. Um, but I, what I wanted to call attention to, many, many fine scholars have studied Kant and Hegel and, Hegel and Schopenhauer and Tacitus. Um, what I wanted to contribute was to talk about how marking Jews as visually identifiable, first in art, then made people want Jews to be visually identifiable in life. It introduced policies to force them to be more visually identifiable in life, and that the very act of being visually identifiable makes you vulnerable to violence and repression in a way that merely abstract textual imprecations do not necessarily do. Basically, the Jews who are attacked today, there are Jews attacked today in Britain, there are Jews attacked today in the Netherlands, there are Jews attacked today in Sweden, there are Jews attacked today in America. Those are the ones who look Jewish, either because they are wearing kippot or because people look at their faces and they think they know what a Jew looks like. Um, yes, the images have been replicated and replicated and replicated once they're introduced. It's very, very hard to get, a, um, get rid of them. So in the book that I'm writing now, I see images that I identify as using anti-Jewish iconography, whatever the attention is, in newspapers around the world, in social media around the world. Muslims have adopted this imagery absolutely in the 1980s when Japan was very angry at Western banks for calling in loans that they thought were going to damage uh, the financial status of Japan, you had an, a weird, thank goodness, short-lived rash of anti-Semitic comic books uh, because they identified Western bankers as Jews, and at least they knew what to make Jews look like. You don't know what to make a Western banker look like, but you know what to make a Jew look like. Um, so there's a long history. There are many, many chapters. Wouldn't I love it if all of this became distant history and irrelevant to everything? It hasn't happened yet. Um, but my book sought to um, connect some developments with a thread that I thought had not previously been drawn out enough in the scholarship. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for the sake of zeroing in on the power of images, which I take it is one thing that you're trying to do here, um, do you see uh, any role for evidence outside the Jewish context that is the power of devotional images, currents and increasing the emotional imagery over the course of the Middle Ages? Absolutely. How, how, how does that factor oh, into that? Absolutely. The I mean, walk into any Catholic church. Um, and I will tell you right now, we have ample evidence that you walk into a Catholic church in the Middle Ages, if you haven't been indoctrinated by, you know, post-Catholic Protestant uh, attacks on Catholic imagery, you walk into a Catholic church in the Middle Ages, you see the colors and bear in mind how rare color was in the life of the average um, medieval commoner. They didn't have colored clothing. They couldn't afford to dye their clothing. They couldn't afford to use, if they were lucky enough to have a plot of land, they could hardly afford to grow flowers in it. Um, so maybe they saw some colored flowers along the way. They saw rich people maybe wearing colors, but you walk in and you see these windows glowing at you with the sun shining through it, and you feel like you were in the house of God. Of course, it created awe. I mean, Catholicism was a pretty successful religion for a whole bunch of centuries. They knew what they were doing with the art. Also, I would mention the incense and the song and the bells. The senses in general are an integral part of creating a sense of devotion, not just in Catholicism. I mean, in many Asian religions, um, music in Protestant religions. I mean, you know, is there anything more soaring than listening to Bach? Uh, I'm a Bach fan. 
so yes, I mean, I, I think art can can very much be for the good. I referred to um, moving people's compassion, looking at Christ was supposed to move people's compassion. Uh, some people it clearly worked. A lot of people were converted by looking at images of art. We have rec records of that, but I'm thinking about Save the Children um, uh, campaigns. Just one, one big-eyed kid will spur far more devotions than textual descriptions of what's happening in other parts of the world. Uh, think about adopt a pet. Uh, all you need to see is a puppy. <laughs> and we all go like this. Images are extraordinarily powerful. And people knew this throughout the Middle Ages. I mean, we have quote after quote after quote. People are always asking, why do we allow images in churches? Isn't there a worry this is going to turn into idolatry? And St. Bonaventure, St. Thomas Aquinas, Gratian the Canonist all said, well, we allow images in churches um, because people are more moved by what they see than by what they hear. Um, thank you. Fascinating talk. Um, Carl Julius Reim, I'm studying history of political thought at UCL and Queen Mary. Um, I was wondering, I, I have to confess, I'm not a medievalist, so I'm... Uh, that is not a comment in this in the, room. In the dark here. <laughs> um, but I remember Wolf Hund in uh, Wie die Deutschen Weiß wurden, how the Germans turned white, arguing that uh, medieval imagery, Christian imagery, also depicted Jews as uh, having black skin color to uh, separate them from Christians. Sometimes. So I was, I was wondering how that fit into your uh, picture. Sometimes they did that, um, but it's really very difficult to generalize about the role of skin color in medieval art because almost each monument, certainly each, it depends very much on, on decade and location, but sometimes it depends upon the, the given monument or manuscript what exactly they're doing in terms of skin color. Um, so you do start seeing a trend of showing the tormentors of Christ with dark skin. Um, sometimes one has dark skin and no hat, and sometimes one has pale skin and a hat. So are they saying that Jews were tormented, that Christ was tormented by a Jew and a Muslim? I mean, dark skin was sometimes used for Muslim, not inevitably used by of Muslims at all. Um, in other cases, Dark skin seems to be not a reference to ethnicity or race, as we would call it, but sort of an abstract connection with night and darkness. Um, so it, it, it's a very trippy, tricky topic. It's an interesting topic, but it's a tri tricky topic and very difficult to generalize. Sometimes Jews were shown... Um, I mean, more typical, they would ascribe to Jews dark hair. And we even have a Jewish German text, a very interesting um, polemical text. It's a Jewish anti-Christian polemical text written in Hebrew. So it's meant for Jewish consumption. They didn't actually go out and read this to Christians. It wouldn't have been particularly smart in that place and time. I mean, not impossible. Jews and Christians did debate. The Middle Ages, the Spanish Inquisition was in Renaissance development, we always hasten to say. The Middle Ages was not nearly so intolerant of debate and dissent as, as uh, Christendom would later become, actually. Um, but they didn't read this to Christians. Um, it, it's called the Old Victory, the Nitron Vitus. And um, it's meant to buttress Jewish confidence and faith and self-respect just in the face of a kind of growing Christian anti-Judaism, which they were afraid would kind of lower Jewish morale and maybe make Jews tempted to convert. So they have various arguments against Christianity, various arguments for Judaism and why Judaism is better. And one of the things they say is, well, um, okay, Christians are blonde and pretty, and most Jews are kind of dark-haired and so less pretty, but the reason Christians are blonde and pretty is because they make love in the middle of the afternoon while they're looking at all of their pictures, and the pretty pictures and the light imprint on them, and that's why their kids are blonde, and that is incredibly immoral. We Jews are much more discreet in the way we make love, so we only do it at night, and we keep our eyes closed, and that's why it's dark. Um, so that's interesting testimony that at least some Jews in parts of Germany saw themselves as looking different, but it's also clearly not a universal generalization, we can say, because we actually have, we have the names of many Jews. I mean, you know, we know a lot about Jewish life, and we have the names of Jewish families and individuals and receipt roles and writings and all that, and there are Jews called the blonde, so there were clearly blonde Jews 
in Germany and England and France are the three places I know best, probably less likely in Spain, at least until the Jews fleeing the expulsions of France and England went to Spain. Did that answer your questions? Okay. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Is is this thing on? At yes. All? Yes, it's good. Okay. Uh, I'm more interested in, uh, I'm not a medievalist, and I'm interested in 19th uh, century and early 20th century representations of um, Jewish masculinity. Mm. I was wondering whether it has any relevance to the Middle Ages specifically about the myth of male Jewish menstruation. Has it been depicted? Um, that myth is, so, so people might not be aware, but they're we have several texts from the 13th century that claim that Jewish males had monthly menses that they bled. Sometimes they were called hemorrhoids. Sometimes they were called um, actual menstrual cycles. I would say, so, so that's, you know, incredibly kind of striking, weird thing to say about Jewish men. My personal opinion, and I have, you know, colleagues I really like and respect who, who don't completely agree with me on this, but I'll tell you my personal opinion is that that very low number of texts has been way overblown just because it's sort of such a striking woo um, thing to say. I have not seen evidence. It, it seemed to um, belong to a small circle of scientists, medieval clerics who thought that they were studying um, physiognomy, anatomy, and science. Um, and they tend to connect it actually, and this is interesting, this relates to the earlier question, to um, Jews being pale of skin, um, and they, because, you know, they actually believed in the Galenic humors, you have bile, you have blood, you have gall, what do we, somebody always has to remind me, and phlegm, thank you very much, and that's supposed to dictate the balance of your humors is supposed to dictate your your character um, and your behavior, and to a certain degree, a lesser degree, your moral status, and they said that, well, Jews are pale and they seem to lack a certain kind of vitality. And so they must be low on sanguine, the, the blood humor. And so they must leave it, lose it somehow. So it's sort of this process of logical reasoning that led them to hypothesize that. I mean, I, they never actually claimed they knew that any male Jews who menstruated or, or bled unduly from hemorrhoids or anything like that. Um, but they do talk about masculinity. And I have been trying for a long time to convince graduate students to work more on representations and self-conceptions of Jewish masculinity. And there's a brand new dissertation out of Ben-Gurion University in Beersheba in Israel about uh, Jewish masculinity in um, 12th, 13th century Ashkenaz. And um, it's quite interesting. It, again, it's not the easiest thing in the world to- Do you know, do you know by whom? Uh, oh, I was afraid you were gonna ask me that. Um, if you send me an email, sarah.lipton at stonybrook.edu, I can send you the whole thing. Um, sorry? Do you know? Slaves of the um, Well, yeah, that, that was less an implication about their masculinity. It had more to do with their lack of um, kind of martial fervor. I mean, obviously, it's one of these sort of you know, self-generating situations. At a certain point in Germany, uh, laws were passed denying not just Jews, Jews and merchants, um, the right to, and clerics, the right to carry weapons. And so once you deprive a man of a weapon, you deprive him of a certain kind of construction of masculinity as medieval culture understood it. They were very bookish. And um, I just wrote an article actually about me medieval Christian clerics anxieties about masculinity because, and, and this is sort of key to what the first questioner was pointing to, everything that Jews were stereotyped of being in sort of the 12th and the 13th century, bookish and urban and evolved in kind of an exchange monetary economy, this is what came to characterize all of Europe. I mean, the story of Europe is the story of growing urbanism, spreading education, um, the, the burgeoning money economy, uh, move away from, you know, the dominance of the warrior class to the, you know, kind of lawyers. 
Um, so so there's, there's a very well-known book written by a good friend of mine called Anti-Judaism, the Western Tradition, which um, builds on kind of all of the anti-Jewish tropes that for example, I and other people like me have identified in 11th and 12th and 13th century texts and shows how they become secularized and redeployed in subsequent centuries. It's called Anti-Judaism, the Western Tradition by David Nirenberg. Um, and he says that, you know, when my texts say that Jews are usurers, his texts say that Jews are bankers. This is a lot where, where Kant is coming from, because Jews were associated with secularism and with the material world, and Kant was supposed what wanted a kind of a return of the idea and the transcendent. And so he was um he sort of typed the civilization of which he disapproved as Jews and then disapproved of Jews for emblem emblematizing the civilization of which he disapproved. It's always a circular process. Okay. Mm -hmm. One question online and then the back. So um, let's start with um, Taya's question, Taya Hanawa. She's asking, aren't Jewish characters the application of features associated with evil and the devil rather than naturalistic? Well, yes, I had to skip over uh, three chapters of my book in order to not keep you here until midnight and well beyond. So what I find interesting is the earliest distortions of the Jewish face, I mentioned in passing, but didn't take the time to show you. Sometimes they were giving noses like snouts, sometimes kind of just long, sometimes they looked like, like bird beaks, that kind of thing. And these and the pointed beard and sometimes horns clearly come out of, yes, demonic imagery, devils are seen to look a certain way because devils were associated with goats, other kind of excoriated beasts and animals that were considered de demonic or at least evil and iniquitous, um, kind of wolves, hyenas, uh, again, goats were very common, negative kinds of birds, carrion birds, that sort of thing. So that's the origin of some of the distorted features and they were not restricted to Jews. Anybody who was a bad guy in art from roughly 800 to 1150 would be given one of these weird kind of demonic or bestial noses. But what I find interesting, and I think what was ultimately much more destructive, is when they use naturalistic artistic style to sort of take what had originally been a beak or a snout and make it look like an exaggerated for form of the kind of nose you might actually see on a person so you know this is clearly a bit exaggerated you know the the head is sort of elongated um the nose is is very large for the face it has this bumpier so you can sort of see the legacy of the bestial snout or nose or hook or something like that but it also looks like a naturalistic caricature. And when I say naturalistic, I don't mean this is what a person looked like. I mean, it is anatomically convincing. So that is the, the development that I traced throughout the various chapters of the book from the more abstracted bestial and demonic to the more naturalistic. And I, I think I took them out of this slideshow, but I, I mean, I could just show you face after face after face after face from every century following this, where the guy looks exactly, well, let's actually go up to our memes. I mean, this guy could be pretty much the same man. And this could be almost the same man. This is Emmanuel Macron, whose nose is nothing like that. So why are they putting a nose that looks nothing like a very recognizable man? Because it's a very shorthand way of telling you something about his character they want to tell you. And the fact that Macron has family background that is Jewish, the artist will say, I didn't know, it's coincidental, what's the difference? It's You've got to exaggerate a nose, there are limited um, tools in the caricaturist toolbox. And when I give these talks only about caricature, I sometimes show caricatures of people that I think are fair and square. There are definitely characters that are fair and square. I would not characterize this one in, as fair and square. I think this is calling him corrupt by evoking Jewishness. Uh, yeah, once a stereotype becomes uh, absorbed within a culture, it obviously becomes very contagious. Yeah. Have you uh, found any evidence of 
those sorts of uh, stereotypes being used, I mean, either in terms of clothing, physiognomy or whatever by Jewish illustrators oh, or yeah. painters. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and one of the reasons I'm writing the book I'm writing now, How Pictures Hate, is simply in order to educate um, both viewers of contemporary images and makers of contemporary images. I don't know if you were all paid attention, but almost a month ago to the day today, well, a month and a week ago in The Guardian, there was a cartoon about the firing of Sharp, uh, the, the head of the BBC, um, kind of implying that he was a crony of Sunak and that he only got his job because they had worked together at Goldman Sachs and who knows what else the cartoonist was trying to imply. And there was a massive outroar that this was an anti-Semitic cartoon. And um, the cartoonist actually published on his website a two-page long mea culpa, um, which I read and downloaded in an Amalot and him analyzing because I don't have two page long mea culpas from anonymous medieval artists. So for me, this is gold, this thing. And he it was more a defense than a mea culpa. It, it was more a defense than a mea culpa. I again as a historian he I wasn't not a Jewish cartoonist. It was what? Steve Bell. He wasn't a Jewish cartoonist. No, it wasn't Steve Bell. This was, was Martin Rosen actually. Was um, he wasn't Jewish himself. I do not claim to have windows into human souls, to quote a previous monarch of this country. Um, I don't know what he knew, what he didn't know, what he believed, what he didn't believe, but he walked through the process. Why do I show him carrying a box that says gold sack? Why do I show him with an octopus? Why do I show him with a puppet in his box? Why is there money everywhere? Why is a pig to the side? I, I mean, to me, like when you pile up the evidence like that, let's just say you've got to be a, a real believer in coincidence. Um, but there is no manual out there to tell people who maybe don't know that an octopus in certain contexts is a long-standing anti-Jewish image or a puppet in certain contexts is a long-standing anti-Jewish image. So I want to put the book out there, if not to stop it, at least to maybe try to dent the plausible deniability that I do think some cartoonists, without naming names, try to take refuge in. He actually did literally say mea culpa, mea culpa, even as he was defending himself. <laughs> Just because you say it doesn't mean you're admitting it. Yeah. Okay, well, um, thank you, Sarah, for, for all the um, answers to the questions. Just one last chance. Are there any more questions or comments in the room or online? Well, the one book is published already. The next book, I'm only just starting. So I don't know. Look for it in a few years <laughs> but this book is out yeah and i'll have to say it's very reasonably priced by my publisher <laughs> i'm very grateful any further questions yes please and speaking of, of images and such are there any trends that have a materialized over the past year that you find particularly disturbing? Any variations on this theme, uh, anti-Semitic or otherwise? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, well, I would say that the most horrendous of the many horrendous allegations hurled against Jews throughout history is the ritual murder charge. As I mentioned, the first one, uh, the boy died, and there was a boy this time. Sometimes they, there wasn't even a boy, but um, this one, the boy died in 1144. It doesn't seem to have morphed into at least a written ritual murder charge until about 1165 or 1170. And I will say, I mean, bear in mind, it, it's, it seems like such a simplistic thing to say, but I do feel the need to remind people a stereotype is not a stereotype the first time it appears. <laughs> um, the first time the ritual murder charge was um, leveled against Jews, the reaction of the king, the sheriff, and almost all, well, basically all the residents of the town in which it happened, Norwich in East Anglia, was, what are you talking about? No Jews were arrested. No Jews were prosecuted. The man who leveled the charge worked for 
the next 15 years to try to get someone pay attention and do something nasty to the Jews and he failed. But what happened was the story got out there. And as with images, so with the stories, it spread and spread. And eventually many Jews have died because of the ritual murder charge. And so the most distressing signs I have seen is there are now revivals of the ritual murder charge updated and in um, other guises. But, oh my gosh, if you just Google, if you have a strong stomach, Google, do an image Google search for adrenochrome. Does anyone know what adren adrenochrome is? Adrenochrome is the latest conspiracy, fantasy, insanity cooked up by people who spend too much time in front of their computers, which says that certain people, many of whom bizarrely seem to be Jews and all of whom are apparently completely manipulated by George Soros, um, try to, it, I think it started as a COVID cure and now it's just a general cure um, to cure disease by drinking children's blood. And this is illustrated by shadowy characters. You can't always see their faces, but if you can't see their faces, because it's more scary to not be able to see their faces, they really don't want to um, make you miss the point. You, they have a big star of David on them. These are the most upsetting things to me. I mean, alleging harm to children is just really the way to push murderous buttons. 